Good morning. Welcome to our uh, Distinguished Achievement no. Award winners in conversation. I'm Kevin Rigdon, and my friend Michael Mailer. We will be your host today. I want to welcome our distinguished panel of artists and award winners. Susan Threadgill. She's the director. Susan? Yeah. Susan is the director of production at the University of Texas at Austin. In her 30-year career in the arts, she has been an actor, playwright, technician, stage manager, production manager, director, combat choreographer, and librettist. Can't hold a job. <laughs> Susan has worked with most of the performing arts organizations in Austin, including the Austin Lyric Opera, the Austin Symphony, the Austin Shakespeare, and the singing group Conspire. Is what? Conspirare. Conspire. Sure. <laughs> I thought it was Texas. I'm oh, sorry. Well. <laughs> you have oh. As an educator, she has a reputation as a generous mentor to young technicians, managers, and performers. She oversees events, including an annual open house at the UT Austin for 45,000 students and a commencement ceremony of 8,500 students, 350 faculty, and 2,500 feral cats. And you probably didn't know that Susan is a paintball queen. <laughs> Shirley Pendergast. Shirley is a trailblazing lighting designer for Broadway Regional Theater. Shirley was the first African-American female admitted to United Scenic Artists Lighting Division in 1969 and was the first African-American woman lighting designer for a Broadway show, The River Niger, in 1973. Shirley has designed the lighting for Elvin Ailey Dance Theater, Paul Robeson on Broadway, the Negro Ensemble Company, the New Federal Theater, and Crossroads Theater, and many, many more. <laughs> In 2011, she received the Vivian Robinson uh, Award for Excellence in Black Theater. And I love pioneer, trailblazer, role model. Welcome, Shirley. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Bob McCarthy. It's because of Bob you can hear me. <laughs> we didn't give him a microphone. Bob is a pioneer in the development of Meyer Sound's source independent measuring system, also known as SIM. Bob has helped push the science of tuning sound systems from the lab into the practical world of uh, theaters, arenas, and stadiums. He is recognized worldwide as an expert in sound system design and optimization. Bob. Dana Taylor. Dana has served as director of vocal music and technical theater at Mount Vernon High School for 23 years and is an adjunct faculty teaching secondary theater methods at the University of Evansville Department of Theater. Dana is the technical editor and contributor to Dramatics Magazine and Teaching Theater Journal. He's a member of USITT, Plaza, and the Educational Theater Association. In 2005, he was honored as Technical Theater of the Year, uh, honored by Technical Theater, as Technical Theater of the Year, sorry, by Stage Directors Magazine, and has received the Education Theater Association Founders Award for his contrib contributions to theater education. And in dinner tonight, we discovered these two gentlemen, path crossed, how long ago? In 1975, we'll get back to that. Dana. Please welcome Ann Roth. You have a fan club. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ann Roth is a Tony and Oscar winning costume designer and the subject of the new USITT monograph 
that is available, the designs of Anne Roth, which is available here at the conference. Anne's design credits include the Broadway productions of The Nance, Death of a Salesman, The Book of Mormon, The Odd Couple, The House of Blue Leaves, and The Best Little Whorehouse in Texas. That was a play, not something down the street. Both. Both. <laughs> <laughs> Anne's films include Midnight Cowboy, Clute, Day of the Locust, Places in the Heart, The Birdcage, and The English Patient, amongst many others. In 2011, Anne was inducted into the American Theater Hall of Fame. Anne. <laughs> Eugene Lee. <laughs> Eugene is the recipient of the Tony Award, the American Theater Wing Design Award, the Drama Desk Award, the Outer Critics Circle Award, the Lucille Lortel Award, the Elliot Norton Award, and the Pell Award. Where do you keep all that? Never mind. Eugene's designs include the Broadway productions of Your Welcome America, A Final Night with George Bush, The Homecoming, A Midsummer Night's Dream, The Pirate Queen, he has been the resident designer of Trinity Rep since 1967. He has been the production designer at Saturday Night Live since 1974. Eugene holds a BFA degree from the Art Institute of Chicago and Carnegie Mellon and an MFA from Yale and three honorary doctorates. In his nomination, I pulled this quote, your work and approach to design are nothing short of inspirational. Eugene Lee. And last but not least, Jim Bauckham. Jim has enjoyed a distinguished career in scenic design, props, and has also done much fine art painting. From 1965 to 1974, Jim was the props master for the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis. After the Guthrie, Jim worked as a freelance set designer, and then while working for Northwest Teleproductions, he designed and supervised over 500 sets for regional and national events. Jim holds an MFA from Yale and has maintained a studio for fine arts painting throughout his career. More, please. And one of the great things about hosting this event is that you get to have friends on stage. I'll try to get through this one. In 1975, I was 19 years old. I had one semester of college behind me. This guy gave me an opportunity. He asked me to come to the Guthrie Theater and be a, uh, an intern. I gladly dumped my paintbrushes down the paint frame, got on the bus, and went to Minneapolis. And that started a career in the theater. Jim was my mentor. Thank you. And now, getting through that, our first question, we're going to do conversation back and forth, and you'll get an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Surely. Hello. Who is your mentor? My mentor was Tom Skelton. Tom made me take the exam. Tom said it was a great traumatic experience. <laughs> and, and he was right. And that's about it. <laughs> 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 and we ask the same question of you. Who was your mentor? Irene Sheriff. I doubt that. Oh, I'd like to hold that. There you go. Of course I would. Um, I was painting scenery at the Bucks County Playhouse, and um, Jean Rosenthal, the lighting designer, said, "You ought to meet this woman, Irene Sheriff." And then Irene came down, and we met. And she said, "How'd you like to work for no money?" <laughs> <laughs> And um, no, I'll keep it. <laughs> and I said, "Oh, sure." I was very young, and I wanted to be a costume designer. 
I wanted to wear a big hat, have a cigarette holder, <laughs> and, and she looked like the person who could make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> and I followed her to California, and I went to work on the movie Brigadoon, which was a very complex job, and she had an assistant, but I became, I guess, maybe the second or third assistant there. And we had a big discussion at that time about who makes the best costume designers, those who want to be assistants or those who want to be costume designers. And uh, actually, I'm just finding out the answer to that. And that was in 53 or 54, around that time. It's a long time ago. But at any rate, I wanted, and so she said that we would do five movies and five Broadway shows, and then, as she said, cut the apron strings. And that's what we did. I'll pass this. Well, I asked you a question, oh. so you're still learning. What makes a better designer? I don't think I'll divulge that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean it. It's a very tender issue. I can't see any of you, so I can't tell what you're looking like, or even if you're there, for God's sake. <laughs> but um, if you are all designers, it's something to think about. Huh? If anybody knows, I'm interested in hearing, I, but I couldn't see you to call on you. See? Save something for next year. We'll have questions <laughs> at the end. <laughs> questions at the end. Susan, the same question. Who, and also, clearly, opportunity presented itself. I had an opportunity. Mentor, and was there an opportunity? Uh, there was. I was attending SMU across the way in Dallas, and I was actually there trying to be a playwright. And there was no program to be a playwright, but uh, they entertained my aspirations for at least a year. And during that time, I had to work in each of the technical disciplines as all of the students there were required to do. And I met a gentleman who was the technical director whose name was Bob Chambers. And before the end of my semester with him, he said, you know, you're very organized. You should try stage management. And I said, sounds fun. What's that? <laughs> And so he uh, recommended me to be an assistant stage manager on a show, and I found that I did like it and that I was pretty good at it. So I stayed with that, and um, then when I went to graduate school at the University of Texas, uh, the teacher there was a gentleman named Rodney Rincon, and he's the one that gave me my first job as a temporary stage manager at the Performing Arts Center. Uh, and then I think within five years, I was the production stage manager. So I'm, I'm a climber. You have to... Watch out for me, so. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Dana. Dana. Oh. <laughs> You're up. That would be me. Mine is a little different because there's no specific person within theater who inspired me. Because some of you may or may not know, I actually don't have any background in theater. Um, I'm a vocal musician, choral conductor, but came to this 25 years ago. And when I look at mentors, I would have to say, a professor, Robert Stoll at Indiana University, who caused me to believe I could really do almost anything and valued my work. And then a colleague of mine, Paul Swanson, who let us play on all of his productions and just try things. And he's, his general thought was, cool, <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> and would let us spend extra money. <laughs> <laughs> Jim. Boy, I've got a uh, list uh, quite quite long. So how do you condense it down? The um, I think of Tanya Mazevich. I think I, I have to t give her the tap. She brought a whole element of design life to my, my work, and uh, and and many many that came. She's very very gracious, and there I was. Uh, as I've told people uh, the original hayseed. Drifted in northern Wisconsin down to this paradise. I didn't, I even, didn't even understand it, for goodness sake. But uh, and I, the, the secret was the, the first two shows for my first season were Richard Three and Lou Brown would directed, uh, designed that. And it was Tanya with uh, Love's Labor's Lost, which was done in a Civil War motif. And of course, I professed to be a Civil War expert 
which was maybe stretching it a little bit, but uh, <laughs> but it, but it was a way to start. And years later, when I was still sending her <laughs> a subscribed Civil War uniform book magazine, she informed me that it was probably all right if I didn't do it anymore. <laughs> uh, anyway, those. Those two, those two designers, Lou Brown and Tanya, hand in hand, turned me around and sent me into the world of design and theater on uh, a real adventure. And, they, the, and I was so, so desperate to please that everything was right. And of course, there, there was a very, when you think of today with the crews and whatnot, we had three IA guys, me and, and another intern who walked in off the street. So we. And we started to turn out this stuff. Fortunately, the right personalities hit in the right place. But the funniest, well, funniest, not at the time, that we did the Way of the World. And we were in rep, so we had three shows building at once. And, um, and I, I got assigned the, uh, an Italianate sort of peasant wheelbarrow, hardly a, an auspicious beginning. <laughs> and you got it in, but I was so proud. I mean, I just. It never worked long as, as on another project like that. So they got, they got it, and I was he was Dr. Guthrie was going to come down the shop to kind of do a perusal of how things were going, and he was just like you know a top sergeant. He'd shoot the bruise about your relatives and what was going on worldwide and whatnot, and managed to end up right by my wheelbarrow with her with some uh, three beds. Yeah. Wheelbarrow with a few. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> anyway, I, I uh, took this wreath we'd put on, trying to be cute. And he, wa he walked down the, the vomit to this house the, on the slope, the vomitory, and walked by and he said, Cut that. <laughs> the door. That was my beginning. <laughs> and I was the, dumb enough to cover it or get on out of there. <laughs> Bob. Bob. Paul McCartney had a band before Wings. <laughs> it's called the Beatles. And that's really where it started for me, seeing the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, a live sound event. And I became completely magnetized by the magic of a live event. And that's where I've been ever since I got involved uh, uh, with improvisational music groups and always wanted to be part of in the in the audience and on the stage when something was happening that happens in real time it's a very special thing no matter how great a recording is to me it's never as great as what happens in a room with an audience and performers on stage so there's so many different musical and these kind of things and theatrical events that I've had the pleasure to be part of and then there's the scientific side that, uh, of the people that inspired me, uh, most notably John Meyer, who <clears throat> I thought I was a pretty smart guy until I walked into Meyer Sound and started talking about, well, I, I always remember when I said, somebody asked me a question, I said, I don't know, but, and then started my answer. He said, you know, it'd be a good idea to just to stop with, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> then you might actually learn. Uh, I was like, Ding. Um, and so I've been on this this quest for knowledge and to be part of these live uh, this this live experience that is to me the the magnetism and this very special thing about this field that we're in and still still in the process of uh, learning and enjoying it. Eugene. Who, yeah, you. <laughs> Who was your mentor? I don't know. Is this working? Yeah. There you go. Uh, I, I, I just make it up as it, every, as it goes along, you know. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. Um, I, uh, I, um, I just get up uh, out of bed every morning and try to have a new idea, that's all. Who, in, who inspired you early on in your career? Can't, can't think of a person. <laughs> Michael, I'm going to hand this off to you. You're going to hand it off to me? All right, well. <laughs> um, 
I think one of the things, you know, what we were talking about last night was was not just the sort of inspiration, but where where you sort of where you felt like you where you took off, where you became yourself, where you became where you found your identity, I think becomes an important question as we think about our inspiration. Um, I asked Shirley last night at one point, I said, you know, when do you find that a production is, is most compelling to you? When is it the most enjoyable? And I, I think I framed it as, you know, is it when the show's really good or when the, the experience working with others is very good? It's really good when it all comes together. This is a cooperative art. And if you do not work with other people, you're in trouble. So anything I do, I try to make not not only bearable but enjoyable for me and it <laughs> if the director likes it too it's fine <laughs> <laughs> well how did you how how do you how do you start how do you when you have a difficult situation how do you overcome that <laughs> ignoring it <laughs> 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 go Jim how do you enhance, enhance that? The, uh, can everyone hear that now? Mm -hmm. Am I talking loud now? Okay. But case in point, the story is, if, if, has anybody ever heard of the Julius Caesar fire, or explosion and fire at the Guthrie on stage, first act? Anyway, we, I think Doug Schmidt is about uh, this weekend somewhere. I saw had, him just the other day in, had in Houston. Had designed it. And we were in the, uh, the, the net air of the, uh, turning out all this magic sort of carved Baroque visit. It was an Aztec motif with, uh, with the, uh, the scenery coming into, with the uh, costumes, the whole deal. But whatever it was, we all thought it was, and everyone thought the previews, the whole deal. What a great deal, because what happened when the peasants, uh, ex-Roman Roman soldiers at this point, uh, made a re rebellion, and we, we hit a hit a cue in a, in a series of flash pots with black powder in the head, blew out. A couple of kids who were playing extras threw the chunk of eyes, ears, nose, and mouth into the crowd. A really a pretty AC deal when you've got an audience like that and you've got foam or not this big bouncing down the moat and into the front row. But anyway, we did it, and it worked pretty good. Well, it was pretty dramatic, and that's exactly what everyone wanted. So we had opened, and... Uh, this head's we, like 20 feet tall, isn't yeah, it? Oh, yeah. yes, 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 yes. Not quite 20, but it, big. <laughs> that's all you need. And it was, we'd, we'd been running for a week. We'd gotten through dress rehearsals, and so it was past opening night, as I recall, and I was, I had gone home, because we had other shows back in the shop we were working on. And I got home, and I was, it just came in the, the, uh, the house, and I think my wife said, you better call the Guthrie. Whenever you get those, uh, those sort of things, I was responsible for all the painting and sculpting and everything on it. So what had happened is the, that this particular night, three, three days in, the, t the queue went along, the six flash pots went up, smoke, kids jumping from 10 feet down, and more drama than you'd care to see. And, uh, and so that was done, and there was hanging smoke in the, in the, the, in the house. And everyone thought, what a great tech effect to have this in there, because it was obviously not a fog machine, it's, you know, directional. So we, uh, we, uh, they went back and started the play over and said, hey, we've had a mishap of sorts, and uh, we're, we're going to back off and start, of which they started to do. And then the Dan Bly, the stage manager, an old friend of mine, uh, tells the story from there. He was on the deck stage managing, and uh, much like a thr thrust would be. And the, the trouble is the smoke never got thinner. It kept going out, and, and everyone's pretty soon the actors are looking around, and the audience is half getting out of their front seats, and and, <laughs> and then one of the deckhands comes running in, the head's on fire. <laughs> well, so you know, so 
I wasn't there yet. I was certainly flying down 294 to get there. But the, uh, what happened is the flash pots were uncapped. And so that's just like, you know, putting a match to something. And this was so early in the foam exodus that we didn't really realize that you, the, the white foam didn't burn. It sort of collapsed when it got near flame. Think of that nice crescent in that head and produced a gas which exploded. <laughs> <laughs> so by the time I got there, the fire department was racing for the finish line along with me. And, the, and it was right down by the green, the, the, the back shops. And there was these two, fortunately we, when we built it, we made a hard shell out of fiberglass thinking we would be clever and make it foolproof. Well, foolproof it was, it was flat proof. <laughs> it was like three giant potato chips out of this 20 foot thing. 20 foot thing. Hey, you wanna get those in there? And there it sat. So Peter Zeller, who was one of the founders of the, uh, the Guthrie, uh, was, was uh, well, everyone in the administration of the, the, the theater was down there at that moment. We did get the thing out, but you know, we had to sit around and the fire department had to chop the three pieces up. You know, there I, the guy begging in paint clothes to get it. You know, and they're just like, hey, bring over a cat, chop this off. So it wouldn't take reignite. Well, anyway, I was, we were doing that and I had the crew running around. And I, so I came up to the stage door and who would I pass but Peter Zeller. Uh, Peter, and he looked at me and he just, he just looked at me like this. He said, we have a matinee in two days, <laughs> which was like no head, no gym. <laughs> so anyway, that was a certain falls in that category. And believe it or not, myself and one stagehand, and everyone disappeared, and I still don't, <laughs> they, don't know where. It, the two of us got up there and we worked overnight for a couple of days. And then by the second day when it started to take shape, everyone within 100 yards of the theater, would, I thought, was coming by to make smarmy remarks about our efforts. But you know, at each stage it looked pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, so off time at the end, one of the, main effect, one of the main effects was when the, everything blew off, a small chunk was to fall on the stage and, you know, a little peripheral trash. And this night, our own general manager of the theater, Don Schoenbaum, was up on the Alpine Slope watching, and the, the chunk of this big fiberglass cover flew through the air, bonk, <laughs> bonk. I kid you not, just everyone thought, my God. I'm sure there were people that wished he was dead anyway. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I... <laughs> I didn't want to be the one. <laughs> Hardly worth sitting up in Stillwater for a piece of scenery to run a miss. <laughs> but uh, so, and that was of great concern, but we got, we choreographed it so it didn't happen again. <laughs> but uh, never know, that's show business. <laughs> Working with Jim in the, uh, the years. Excuse me. <laughs> My English teacher in, in, in uh, Bloit, Wisconsin. That, that, that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was that? There you go. He, he mentioned Beloit, Beloit, Wisconsin. Well, that's where I went to undergraduate school. <laughs> when the school, as I recall, was more reminiscent of John Bellucci than anybody else. <laughs> okay, who wants it? Work, working with Jim in those early years, we used to joke that we needed to keep a cage of canaries in the shop because we were experimenting <laughs> with, <laughs> well, what happens when you burn styrofoam? You die eventually. If you're Cyanide. Yeah. yeah. But uh, when it blows, we had like, you know, a good na napalm effect. <laughs> and I was, I was, <laughs> going, it, it, you know, it, I was brain dead by Bob. this time. <laughs> I can't remember the question. <laughs> a, a, long, a long time ago, it was about sort of when, when is the work most saddest? When is, it, when is it really work for you? When do things gel? Is it, is it the project? Is it the people? 
Well, of course, it's when you are on a on a winning on a winning team when when it's all coming together with great art and uh, and good science, and with <clears throat> with not having I beams blocking your speakers. <laughs> um, you know, it's it's little things like that. Um, but it's to me, it's a it's a team sport. It's always been a team sport, and I consider the interpersonal skills a really important part of the of the of the equation. Um, I always I learned early on that <clears throat> if you're a jerk, you can you have to always be right, because as soon as you're as soon as you're wrong and a jerk, they want you off the show. But if you're a nice guy, you can actually make a few mistakes and they'll let you give you a pass. You know. So I've done my best not to burn bridges and to, and to stay a part of, of uh, the team, and mostly to learn what I could from other players in the disciplines. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with so many of the great sound designers, <clears throat> Abe Jacob, Tony Miola, uh, Duncan Edwards, uh, Tom Clark, uh, I could just keep naming them on and on. And get, I, I got the opportunity to work with and see what what they know and what they do and sort of pick the parts that I like the best out of their quill and add them to mine. So that's kind of my, my inspiration. Okay. And can you go on? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Is it, it what, what gives you the most uh, enjoyment in your work? Is it the people? Is it the projects? Is it the people or the projects? Or both? Or both. <laughs> or a fourth answer of your choosing. <laughs> well, this is so complex. If we have another two, three hours. <laughs> um, when do I have a good time? Sheriff told me a long, long time ago that if you get 70% of what you want, you're extremely lucky. That's always been in the back of my mind. Always. Uh, what, what little fights not to have, what, the, the truth is that I, I've caught an awful lot of criticism for this remark I'm about to make, but the ideal thing is that you are the support of the director. And you want it, he wants it to look like he designed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, in the past, the latter part of my career, I have worked with the same people over and over and over. That is not the case this year when I'm going to work with three new directors. <laughs> I don't know. I, um, I wish there were questions because just <laughs> extemporizing this dialogue is not easy, as, but let me just think. Um, when I have, if I can walk out of the stage door and say, if they don't touch that, I'm happy. If I get paid, I'm happy. If, if I'll tell you, I'm also very, very particular about my crew. That comes first to me in my contract. Your contract is when they hate you most. You make a contract, it doesn't matter what you want, the, you must insist on it. And then after it's all over, they like you, uh, they love you. But you must insist on all the things that you want, and that includes the crew. I am, naturally, the movie crew is the most difficult because you're out, you might be going to freaking Romania or, uh, but, you want your, I want my wardrobe people. I want my milliner. I want my cutter. I want, I want, I want, I want. And it pays to get what you want. Um, I'm doing a play now with Denzel Washington, not a cakewalk. He, and, um, so I had to have the right personalities to deal with him. And I knew that person, and that person knew that I knew her, and she knew that she could get more money because 
I was going to push for. <laughs> it's that kind of nonsense that, uh, you, that I dealt with. Uh, let me think what else. At any rate, if I'm happy with my team and the people who are making the costumes, um, I'm very happy. I'm very happy and I can do it. Last night we were talking about something that I may repeat, although I don't think they'll enjoy this. <laughs> but doing Raisin, I had designed it and we made it and all of the actors were very, very happy. All of them. That's highly unusual. But um, they were all happy. And uh, so when we got to the theater, you know, uh, I'm sure the endless, torturous technical rehearsals. I sat through all of those, and I made very minor changes, very minor. And by the eighth day of, well, the fifth day of technicals, and then starting into the dress rehearsals, by the eighth day of the whole thing, I was positively finished, done. But the lighting people were there, and they had this huge table in the theater with assistants and lights and... Yes. I want to thank them. Especially that one. I want to thank them. They are really vicious. <laughs> Those lights are vicious. <laughs> no? <laughs> There's more of us up here than you. <laughs> you like them. No. You like that light in your eye. I'm At any... You are kidding me. <laughs> At any rate. So, and, th and that, those lighting people sit, and every time the director during rehearsal changes some blocking, they're changing and they're modeling, the director is convinced that they are his main support, and I, who am leaving the theater, <laughs> have abandoned him. <laughs> that is something that um, I haven't figured out how to do it, but... Um, they're always calling me back and saying, do you think you're finished? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then they stutter around thinking of something for me to do, but there is nothing. Anyway, that's, that was mentioned last night. That's all. I'm passing this on. I have nothing more to say. I can pass it to you. I'll give it to you, Jean. I'll give it to go back to something that Shirley said, that the process is very important. Because I've found over the years that happy people make better art. And so I actually used to be teased um, by one director when I was working at Austin Lyric Opera that I kept the cleanest floor in opera because my rehearsal deck was swept and mopped every morning, which might seem excessive, but the first time you see the diva in rehearsal get up doing this and look at you at the table, the next day you will make sure that floor is clean. So I try to keep happy people because happy people make better art. And then the best part I like, of course, is live performance. When you're riding the wave, you're calling the cues, it's all clicking and you can make that designer and that director say, yes. And that's it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Eugene, you've got the mic. <laughs> what, oh well, the, the mic. <laughs> Look, I'm, I, what was the question? Something about being happy, uh, being content? <laughs> I'm always happy. <laughs> I mean, uh, I would say design is highly overrated. Uh, but, uh, they, um, uh, what? yeah, it's all good, you know? Uh, let's see. Um, Jimmy was very nice, called out my name the other day. Uh, that helped the restaurants, you know, when you go to dinner, you know, that the table is ready in New York, you know? That, um, we have nine companies of Wicked Worldwide. That's, that's always good, um, you know. What does that do? That makes you a millionaire, by the way. <laughs> uh, 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 which is good. Uh, uh, well, that, that makes you happy, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, it doesn't hurt. I live in Rhode Island, you know. I don't live in New York. Um, too big. Well, I do have a driver, you know. Uh, well, yes, of course. Um. <laughs> Eugene, did, could you talk about taking risks? Taking risks as a designer? I, 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 I don't know. You know, it, it, 
we're in the greatest, it's, like, it's such a great business, you know? On the other hand, you know, I've been fired in the lobby, you know, that's always bad. <laughs> you know, the, the, new group is, uh, the, the new group is being in the lower lobby, you know, so they don't mix up, you know about that. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's okay. I, I mean, I do. No, 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 I just... you can have this mic. <laughs> Although, I, I, not to digress, I, can I digress at something else? Sure. Meyer Sound Systems, okay? I'm always a little suspicious of sound people. <laughs> you know, they, 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 you know, no, seriously, no, no, seriously, they, they come and they say, they say, uh, you, you have to have this piece, you know, it's like X75-20, you know, and you go, what, what is that? Don't, don't worry, you have to have it, you know, it's $1,400 or whatever it is, and you have to have it. So anyway, I, I was working on this set for Jimmy, you know, uh, 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 in New York, and, and we put in this Meyer sound. We, we made the studio, we gutted it all, and, 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 and put up lots of insulation, and, and made the to spaces totally dead, okay? And then we have this Meyer sound system. The bad thing is it has speakers everywhere, you know, they're all over, you know, they're not terribly good looking, and, you know, mm -hmm. but, but so, <laughs> They say, no, seriously, you're in this, you're in this studio, Johnny Carson used to use it, and, and it, it's now totally dead. And, and <laughs> you, you go and you say, the, you, turn on the, you turn on the sound system, right? And it's perfect, I'm telling you. I mean, I could talk to people at the back of this auditorium, right? I mean, so sometimes there, it actually works. That makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> My answer to that is what, what he's talking about is um, some really fast, uh, advanced technology that we put into Jimmy Fallon's uh, Tonight Show studio, which is um, the, called the Constellation System, which allows you to basically take a room and first make it acoustically very dead, and then with speakers and, and hidden microphones that lighting people don't like too much because there's micro, a grid of microphones hanging all throughout the uh, ceiling space, you're able to create reverberation as, as you need it for a particular part. So when Jimmy speaks, you have certain settings. When the, the Roots band plays, you liven it up in a different way. And when U2 plays their acoustic guitars right there on the stage, you make it an appropriate acoustic space for that. It's really the future of acoustics, and you're going to see that more and more, because anytime you build a room, you're stuck with the walls you got. Um, and if you can make those walls magic walls that can be either dead or alive uh, on a queue, how much better is that? It just costs a lot of money. And he deserves all the credit. Because it, seriously, though, it, without, a, um, without designers that understand integrating the look, and we had all the speakers painted with his set colors, um, <laughs> color matched. Um, <laughs> and so it, you have to integrate that in with the scenic so that it all disappears and makes a great aesthetic look. Seriously, the, the, uh, the scenic design is wonderful, and it's acoustically great. That's the key to that Tonight Show thing, is that it works visually and acoustically. I have one more thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, have I, going, uh, no. have I taken up too much no. time? No, no. Okay, this is a, a costume hint, and this has to do with uh, um, a costume that is not necessarily made to order, but let's say half is and half is found on the streets. I don't know if you guys, if anybody in this room is, has, knows what Midnight Cowboy was, but I'm going to use that as an example. Uh, what the designer, I, like to do is when the actor, certainly one that I don't know, who's been flown in overnight and is nasty and is in the fitting room, Dustin, <laughs> uh, and he and I, and I convince him that he and I are going to create a character. Now this character is beautifully written, so it, it sleeps on, on uh, 
uh, pool tables. He, he has a rough 42nd Street life. Never bathes and uh, scroungy. At any rate, I have his costume in a closet that I have decided what it is behind the mirrors in the fitting room. He comes into the fitting room and we have this tea or coffee or whatever and we're and I'm telling him that he and I are going to create this character when I know it is here in the room. This happens on every single thing I've ever done. So what happens is that I say, just be a dummy for a minute and just let me play. And they go with that. And I had some shoes that had been hollowed out and weighted to make him walk funny. And I had maybe three pair of those and they were all over the floor. And then there were dirty, stolen class rings. There, were, there was a suit from 42nd Street which I had dyed and it was pretty ugly purple color. There was one shirt that I liked, but I had maybe four or five or six shirts around for us to try because I wasn't certain. And a dirty undershirt, blah, blah, blah. So we're trying things and I'm bending over and now in the room is a, comes somebody from, from the movie company, somebody from the tailor who's standing by to do a hem uh, there's a bunch of, I had asked for some rotten suspenders, they came in. The place was a disa disaster. There were empty coffee cups and whatnot, and we're looking in the mirror, and I'm bending down, adjusting the bottom of the trousers, and suddenly, as we're looking, and I said, oh, we got to have dirty fingernails. You have to have filthy fingernails in this ring that you've stolen from somewhere. And suddenly, you look in the mirror, and the both of you connect that there is somebody in the mirror that is not Dustin Hoffman, and it's not me. It is another character coming. And it's unmistakable, and it's very exciting, and sort of like that, and it's like, stand back, everybody, and let it breathe. And as that happens, there is no question, you just keep going, the right shirt, and the right shoe, and the right, it all falls into place. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. That happens on every single thing I've ever done, no matter what it is. That's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so, Dana, I think I want to pick up on what, what Kevin had said there earlier, which is the sort of risk. And I think, you know, what's the importance of risk? Are there, what are some major risks you've taken? Which. I and also your job. to bring that into how do you encourage yeah. these young budding artists to take risks and to fail? Well, of course, the biggest risk you take every day is just showing up. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. and that's teaching like anything else that we do is it's reactive. You can't really prepare for it. You know, I had a professor in college who said curriculum started when the classroom door closed, the idea being whatever you thought you were getting ready for, that's not what you're really going to do today. That, like what they were alluding to, this ability to go with the flow, to meet the kids where they are that particular day. As far as risk taking for myself, <clears throat> I don't see that what we do is risky in terms of seeking out opportunities or trying new things. The worst thing that's going to happen is it's not going to work, and that's okay. And trying to convince the students of the same thing, that it's okay to, to fail. I have discovered recently that I've become a bit of a micromanager when it comes to the students. I want them to do so, I want them to do well, and so I'm doing all kinds of things to make sure they succeed, which is doing them a disservice. And so this year, I stay out of the booth during performance. I'm not up there gasping, grasping the railing because something, because the light, well, yeah, because <laughs> the light cue is a half second late. That this is part of the learning process. As far as encouraging the artistry is just try to let them play. You know, if, when, we're, when we're cueing a show, what do you think? I, I especially like it when 
when students become my colleagues more than my students. Mm -hmm. And that I know if they're up there during tech week and they see something wrong with a queue, they fix and don't tell me. And that's a risk, but, but there's a great reward there. Uh, same thing. I'm going to switch mics a little bit. <clears throat> I do a lot of puzzle solving, and there's always a risk because you might, you might not do well. And I, I love complexity. I love a, <clears throat> a, challenging, uh, a challenging acoustical puzzle. Uh, every sound system is a, is a weave of parts, and you have to make them all work together. And sound is always challenging because it's, it's invisible which means that nobody can see it, which means everybody's got an opinion. We like to say everybody's got two jobs, theirs and sound. Um, <clears throat> and because nobody can see it, they think that, that their opinion is just as valid as somebody that actually knows something about it. Um, <clears throat> but to me, the, the, the risks that you take are constantly pushing yourself to, to not get into habits, to, to pioneer past what you know and, and see if you can do it better. I've always been uh, one to try to push to find a way to keep the thing going better, if, if for nothing else to, to prove to myself that the way that we're doing it now is the best way, because you always want to stay on top of that. And that keeps the learning curve going and keeps the creative excitement going. Shirley, can you talk about risk? And then, Michael, while Shirley's doing that, could you find your way out to the audience? And we're going to open up to you for questions. Talk about risk taking. I think the biggest risk I ever took was have one light on stage, which was a night light for the stage, and two actors standing around it talking. And to me, it looked gorgeous. And Again, the director thought it looked gorgeous, so I was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and you take a risk depending on what the production is. Uh, I am lucky enough to work with smaller companies that take big risks and encourage you to do the same thing. But that one scene, I think Mr. Lee was a, I think he was the set designer. And it was up in Rhode Island. And the name of the play was Feasting with Panthers. With Panthers, if he remembers. But it was pretty good. That's about it. Thank you. Great. We have uh, some house lights. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, there are people out there. Yeah. Questions from the audience? Michael has a microphone. Let's try to come forward. Stand up. If you want a question, there we go. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Sasha, and uh, I'm from Duluth, Minnesota, and I'm a costume designer. And I'm curious, um, I find theater very enlightening and enriching, but I also find myself being kind of selfish and looking for other artistic outlets. Um, what are some of the things that you guys do outside of theater to sort of enrich yourselves artistically? The question is, what do you do outside of theater to enrich yourself artistically? Who wants to answer this? You've got the microphone. I can pass it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you think this is easy? <laughs> I like to do two projects at the same time. Um, and I don't mind if one's in Oklahoma and one's in New York. I, I, I mean, if the airplanes work, I don't mind that. I like the, that. Um, I like keeping my mind agile. On the other hand, I have a crew that I work with in Europe, and I like to go there and work with them a lot. They're very, the, the crews in Italy and the crews in London are very different. Uh, and I like working with both of them. I, I think I like working in Italy best, better. That answers the question, huh? <laughs> Anybody else like the gym? 
better wine in Italy. <laughs> I, I, where is this person? Over here. Oh, no, hi. Uh, I, I'm like Anne, except not, two, 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 two things isn't enough for me. I, I, I like about seven things, eight things going on. But I like a lot of things, so, you know. Someone asked me a question. What do you do besides designing? Oh, what, do you, what do you do to what, inspire yourself other than? Bowling sure, bowling, well, dancing, I, sure. Well, I have three houses. I have 15 boats. I have five cars. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in a lot of things. I built myself a greenhouse. What do you grow? plants, you know, I like. Uh, what um, do you grow, Eugene? Uh, well, we, in the, we've had a very bad winter in the east. I mean, you know, so it's been very cold. Uh, so it's nice to see lemon trees and, and limes and things growing. This is silly, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, I mean, we're also, I don't know, you know, you know, in, in our costume department at NBC, when uh, we go out into the hallways to shoot, okay, uh, we always have uh, Abe Lincoln, a chorus girl, and a llama, okay? <laughs> we don't know why that is anymore, you know? But I like that, you know? <laughs> You know, we, we, we see, we, do, we just order it up. Soon, oh, they're shooting in the hallway. Order the llama, you know. <laughs> it's, it, it's a, we have a very good time. It, I mean, you know, I, I have the best time. I mean, you know, because that's, then, that, then it's not, you know, then it's not like work, you know. I mean, because that, my, my, my father, who was a mechanical engineer, you, you know, I, I remember uh, my mother walking out of one of my plays, and my my father turns to my mother and says, and they pay him for this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. We have another question. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Joe. I'm with uh, IATSE out of Las Vegas, Nevada. In, in my career in the past 10 years, I've, I've become a, sort of a jack of all trades. I've done everything from carpentry to camera. For the younger members here today that may have a, a whole gambit of uh, things that they'd like to accomplish, I'd like to know, um, did you start in other areas of the theater and then find out, how did you find out where your passion was, where you wanted to specialize? And if, if you could talk a little bit about uh, broadening your horizons and working in other departments. <laughs> I wondered if that was coming here. Uh, <laughs> as I started, said before, I wanted to be a playwright at first, and uh, it didn't take much more than a year for me to figure out that I really didn't want to watch what someone else would do to my work, the director. Um, and so uh, then I got recruited into stage management, and I started doing that. Uh, most of the time I was working on Shakespeare and straight plays. And then one day I got a call from my boss saying, uh, you read music, right? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, the student stage manager quit uh, at the opera, and I need someone to step in. So be there tonight at 6. Great. So I show up, and they hand me a score to Benjamin Britten's <laughs> Albert Herring. Now, for those of you who might not be musically inclined, this is a, a mo fairly modern piece that features things like dotted bar lines, which means that the musicians may hold the notes past that or not as they see fit. And if you haven't been practicing with them, rehearsing with them, and seeing what they do, what they tend to do, it's a mess when you're trying to read it the first time. So that is, without doubt, the worst rehearsal I ever called in my life. And I went to the director afterward and said, I need this music. I need to hear it. So I took it home and listened to it for six solid hours. So when I got back the next night, I could do it. So I got tagged as someone who could do opera. And for years, outside of being a house stage manager at the Performing Arts, Arts Center, all I did was opera. And finally, I thought, well, is that what I want to do? So I went purposely back to Shakespeare and did a show in San Antonio for the opening of the San Antonio Shakespeare Festival. And the part that I loved most about that production was that they had a live guitarist underscoring all the soliloquies. And I thought, okay, yeah, music, music is it. So it's either gonna be 
opera or musicals. And uh, that's been the focus of my career as a stage manager until I moved forward into production management. Okay. Anybody else want to take a crack at that? I was just going to say sometimes when you're looking at the things that you like to do and teaching high school, we're trying to introduce a lot of different disciplines so that students can see what's out there for them. But obviously, if you find something that you just gravitate to that, that excites you, then trying to find a way to do more of that is always going to be a plus. I do know that as you're starting out, sometimes you do the work you're given to do. And I do think that there is bloom where you're planted because it's not just the skill you're learning, it's, it's also the skill of being a good worker, the, the skill of being, knowing how to be a colleague, to work well with other people. And because you never, <laughs> I have a master's in choral conducting, you never know where you may end up. <laughs> the, we, the, the, from my point of view, you wanna start off with the general as general uh, a platform as you can, and then see where that, like you said, see where that lands, and if you see a door open that looks interesting, go in there. Um, you know, I'm now a specialist in fast Fourier transform acoustic measurement, which sounds like total gobbledygook, right? <laughs> I didn't want to do that as a kid, I can just tell you that. Uh, plan A was to be a famous musician, and that ended on my first day of college, when I saw real musicians. It's like, <laughs> okay, plan B starts now. <clears throat> and so you, what happens is you if you, you, if you find something that really looks exciting, jump in there and just run with it and see where it goes. And if, it, if you can keep going on it, it'll just lead to good things. Have no fear, recognize opportunities, grab the opportunities. Yeah. Michael? All right, got another question. Hello? My name is Connor Thompson. I'm from Western Connecticut State University in Connecticut, obviously. What has? <laughs> He's over here. Good morning. What has to be the most terrifying experience you've had when starting off in a career in theater, when you didn't know if you're going to continue into the field that you wanted to pursue? Terrifying experience in the theater. Uh, <laughs> Terrifying experience. Are these all students out there? I can't tell. I like. I, I sense I like them. The uh, 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 just a side. Well, no, I won't say it. Uh, let's see. Terrifying. Uh, oh, no, I, ca I can't do it. I, the, uh, oh, okay, okay. My first Broadway show, dude. Okay. Uh, uh, so the first thing we do is that the director Rocco Bufano. Okay, ever heard of him again? I, uh, uh, okay. I, I don't think so, okay? My, f my first experience on in, in, um, Broadway, okay? The first thing we do is we take out all the seats, okay? All of them, okay? Broadway theater, yes, okay? And then we kind of extend the mezzanine to make a bigger space, okay? Uh, without a balcony. Then we send, then we need a lighting grid. I saw Richard Pilbro here. Uh, it made me think of this. Uh, so we, 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 uh, we, sent, we sent a few stagehands up, uh, up over the ceiling, you know, and uh, to, to spot the lines. And the way we do that is uh, they have a big pipe, and they, you hear them tapping on the, on the plaster, and then a huge chunk falls down. <laughs> and, and, you, and you see the pipe sticking through the plaster up there, and you say, Mike, not quite right, four feet to your left. <laughs> okay? okay, so that's the way we do it. <laughs> and, then, and then we bring in the dirt, you know, local one, very expensive union, uh, uh, bring up all the dirt, we put it all over, you know, and uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the, the producer, uh, and, uh, well, naturally uh, the dirt didn't work, equity, I didn't like the dirt, <laughs> it had to all be taken away. See, one more this time. was not good for one's first show, okay? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's honestly, it was kind of, it, it's funny now, but it wasn't so funny at the time. The, uh, the, 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 the producers were Peter and Adela Holzer, okay? And they had made their money in shipping and other things. And uh, her, her nickname was Pumpkin, okay? 
And uh, they, we kept spending and spending money. One day the star came in and said, uh, uh, pointed to the ceiling and, and, said, and said, I have this vision, a bit vision. I want to be, be on the back, back of an angel with follow spots' his eyes. Okay, can we do that? And, and Peter, the husband, said, absolutely not my money, dear. I mean, if you want to spend the money, you know, and Pete Fowler was there, the legendary scenic builder, you know, <laughs> and of course he said, of course we can do it, you know, so we, we, we sent people up, there was a huge ornamental grill in the ceiling, like 16 feet in diameter, took a saw, and you see him sawing it all around, <laughs> wham, okay, 16 foot hole. <laughs> and Pete Fowler Jr., who was did automation, built, built this thing, you know, and, um, and, and of course, by that, I think that's when the director got fired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, anyway, uh, and, you know, to cut it short, not to ramble on, uh, you know, I, uh, oh, they, at the time, uh, the, uh, I didn't speak, by the way, uh, uh, the, the stagehands called me Helen Color. You know, they, they, they would say, is Helen Color in the building? <laughs> I, I speak now a little bit, okay. So, so it, and I, I, go, I go home to Rhode Island, you know, and uh, well, you know, I, I think my career is over. And I pick up the paper one day, and there, there's a picture of a boat, like a 60-foot boat on the rocks off Narragansett in Rhode Island. <laughs> and and the, the article is, uh, the yacht belonging to Peter and Adela Holzer goes aground <laughs> on the crew coming back from a New York Yacht Club cruise uh, in Maine. I'm in the club now, of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's a side issue because I have so many boats. Uh, so, uh, you know, so, and then uh, uh, P uh, Pumpkin, Pumpkin got a, a money laundering, raising the money, so she, she went to jail, uh, 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 um, shared the cell with uh, that doctor, you know, I don't know, some famous uh, uh, criminal. And, and, and they got divorced. Anyway, that was my first show, you know? <laughs> but all, all I can say, and, and, and then I'll stop. Uh, so I, that's it. I, I didn't walk into the Broadway theater uh, for years. And then the next thing I did was Candide at the Broadway theater, and we ripped it all apart again, <laughs> okay? And when I came back, of course, it had been perfectly fixed, you know, the ceiling, perfect, everything. And then we, you know, started ripping seats out again. <laughs> Oh, the, oh, yeah, the oh, Starlight yeah. Express. That's right. No, that, well. <laughs> Michael. We have uh, one more question, and then uh, we'll be done for the morning. Hi, uh, Colin Shea from Indianapolis. Um, my, my question is specifically for Bob McCarthy, but probably could be open up to anyone. Um, when you are dealing with uh, working with other people, how do you... Um, how do you deal with them when they're thinking they're an expert in sound? You know, you were talking about that, you know, using the producer button, which is like, you know, a fake button or something. Any other, you know, tactics? Uh, there, there, I learned this in Japan. Uh, I did a lot of work in Japan, and it's a very wonderful thing they have in their culture called face saving. And it's a very important piece of, of their culture is that you don't want to make anyone look bad. Um, and so I've ad adapted a, um, a approach that I, let's say I walk into a place and I can see, okay, that's not going to work. This guy designed it. He's got this whole crew around him. I've got to A, get that fixed, and B, make him still look good. So the trick is that you bring the person in and you say, you, you basically make them discover it. So I'll put all the pieces in place to say, wow, I wonder about, you know, if maybe perhaps this might mm, be a concern and you lead them to the point where they discover and they say, hey, I, I think the, it looks like the speakers are aimed wrong. Like, <laughs> what do you think we should do? Ah, uh, how about 10 degrees this way and bingo comes the answer. Then they get, they get to still be in control of their show because if you, if you fix somebody's show and you save their butts, but you embarrass them, they still can't ever have you back in the place again, yeah. okay? So you have to find a way to keep everybody looking and feeling good on the team. It's a really, to me, it's a, such an important skill 
because then you've really made a friend for life, especially if they realize that you just saved their butt and didn't embarrass them, and it goes from there. But don't, don't play the, I've been through these prominent productions, so I know the facts things like, the puff-up thing is really ugly. And curtain. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, before we before we depart, uh, Richard Pilbro is uh, is coming on stage and he's going to announce something to us. Hi, good morning all. This is the scariest moment of my life. Fol exactly. Following this lot, can you imagine? <laughs> oh Jesus! I have an announcement to make, sort of on behalf of uh, USITT and the Wally Russell Foundation. Everyone's probably forgotten who Wally Russell was. So very quickly, he was the head of Rank Strand for many years. He was technical director of the LA Opera. He was a lighting designer. He was actually an astronomer. And he was an amazing character, a mix of businessman and artist. He like wrote the spec for the Source 4. He did a lot of the development work on Very Light and generally had a bit of an influence on us all. He died. Uh, 23 years ago, and a group of industry bosses, I suppose, got together and founded a foundation, raised quite a lot of money, and we have four activities. We've done an internship, a lighting internship at the LA Opera, another one at the Canadian Opera. It's been running for 20 years plus, and we give uh, a newcomer award for the most distinguished contribution from a young person in the world of backstage. And we have a Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, there isn't a Newcomer Award this year because we've had the handover from the Wally Award to the USITT. Next year there will be one. And if anyone is really bright out there, and wants to win something, make sure you apply next year on the USITT website. Okay, then we do have a Distinguished Achievement Award. Uh, I've only, I've a couple of times been put up for a Tony Award, and today's winner always wins it. The award of a lifetime achievement goes to Jules Fisher. You all know who Jules Fisher is, so I'm not going to repeat his <laughs> career. Uh, but he's a brilliant theatre consultant, architectural lighting designer, and stage lighting designer. And he is getting this thing this year. It's a pretty glass whatnot. <laughs> <laughs> As you may notice, looking around the stage, he's not here. <laughs> uh, but he has, I think, sent a little film clip which you're all going to have to look at. Are we ready to roll it? Because, Jules Fisher, this Thank is your you life. Award, and for the recognition of my work, I am truly honored. Truthfully, I consider myself too young to receive a Lifetime Achievement Award, <laughs> since I'm still striving to be better in my field. But I accept it with pleasure nonetheless. It is a great honor to be in the company of the 20 past luminary recipients, particularly the living ones but all of whom yes. I emulate, learn from, or stood upon their shoulders. Wally was a giant figure in our industry, and over the years, I benefited in my own work from many of his contributions. Here's one example. The musical, Bob Fosse's Dancing, which I lit in New York City at the Broadhurst Theater in 1978. The lighting control system consisted of 84 3,000 watt resistance dimmers operated by three electricians. When we moved the show to the Ambassador three years later, it was controlled by the first century light palette and one electrician. Thank you, Wally. Many of you know that I'm an amateur magician. I began working in the theater because I saw light as magic. Well, sometimes magic is light. Thank you again for this award. Great. 
Thank, thank you, Jules. Thank you, distinguished company. May the 31st at Broadway Lighting Masterclasses, he's going to get this glass thing hurled at him again, <laughs> and this time he'll be there to catch it. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you all. Yep. And thank you all. And I'd like, yeah, thank you thank to... You. Uh, Got a round of applause for Jules. Now if we can have a round of applause for all of our Distinguished Achievement Award winners. And Jim, our USITT Award winner. And thank you all for, for coming. Thank you.